Happy Pentecost. You don't have to wish me Happy Pentecost. <laughs> I'll be happy. I'm happy just to be here. Uh, truly, I am. You know, you, you think your life consists of the places you see each day, the people you speak to each day or pass by each day. It's real easy to think that because why would it be any different? How could you possibly touch someone beyond where you are? The things you do each day, the places you go, your weekly appointments, coming to church. But College Park Baptist Church, I want you to know that you may be as Pentecostal a church as there is in the country. For 15 years or so, I have known your pastor, Michael. Michael and I met when I was somewhere in the middle of my second adolescence, and he was a real maturing influence on me, as I'm sure that he has been on you. You know, they laughed at that in the early service, too. I don't know what he told you. But, but what that has meant for me, the gift that has been to me, is that while I never worshipped in your sanctuary before, never participated in a physical, present way in the life of the church, I have heard College Park stories now for 15 years. And in every story, I, I've heard love, and I've heard grace, and I've heard courage, and I've heard about how the presence of God is in you and working through you to touch the world. And I want you to know that hearing stories about you has touched me. How does that happen? It's Pentecost. It's Pentecost. God sent His Holy Spirit to us. That's how it happens. That's how we get taught. That's how we get convicted. That's how we come to understand the things of God. God is in us, teaching us, making us see the world differently. Our Gospel reading this morning, as the disciples locked away behind closed doors, they're frightened, they're scared, they're sweating bullets, they're, they're concerned that what has happened to their leader may be the very same thing that happens to them. They're, they're not exactly enthusiastic about getting out into the world. And then Jesus shows up. And then Jesus is there. And they see Jesus. And everything changes. Famously, Thomas is not there. Otherwise, we wouldn't really remember Thomas, would we? He's not there, which leads to his saying, I don't believe Jesus is alive. I don't believe Jesus showed up. Unless I touch the scars, unless I touch the wounds in his hands, I won't believe a week later, Jesus shows up again. Thomas doesn't have to touch the wounds. Thomas just says, my Lord and my God. Which is what we do in those precious moments when we see Jesus. But we can't see Jesus. Not the way Thomas saw Jesus. No, we can't, but we can. It's so confusing sometimes. The, the Gospel is like that. You know, Jesus is always saying one thing and, and, and putting another thing, turning things upside down. The first shall be last and the, the rich will be made poor, the poor will be rich, and, and, and blind eyes do see. Even our blind eyes see. We come into the world and we're taught. We're taught how to look at things. We're taught how things are supposed to be. And, and we're told you know, you know, how to label everything that we see. But those labels aren't always God's labels. Those categories aren't always ones that were created by Creator God. Some of them were created by us. Some of those categories and some of those labels are not meant to set us free or to save us or to liberate us. They are meant to oppress us, keep us captive, deny the very real grace that God would give to each of us. Thomas saw Jesus 
and it changed everything. My Lord and my God. Boom. And there he was. Seeing Jesus. Seeing Jesus is a vitally important spiritual practice. And we take it for granted. I take it for granted. You look out at, at a group of people gathered in a, a sanctuary and, and you think, well, we've all seen Jesus. And maybe we've all seen as much of Jesus as we need to see. Or, or maybe we've seen a lot of people talking about Jesus. Maybe we've seen a lot of people who, who speak about Jesus. But they don't really show us Jesus. They don't really show us the Jesus who offers grace to us. They don't really show us the Jesus who would kneel down and pick us up when we've fallen. Stay with us when we're hurting. They don't really show us the Jesus that Scripture shows us. They don't really show us the Jesus that God sent to us to save us. A lot of folks out there saying, Lord, Lord. Maybe they haven't seen enough of Jesus yet either. But here we are. Not altogether unlike Thomas. Wanting to see Jesus. Wanting to believe. And there He is. But we don't see Him the way Thomas does. How do we see Him? How do we see Him? By the work of the Spirit. Proverbs 20.12 says... The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. If we see Jesus, it's because God has made a way for us to see Jesus. How do we see? God makes it possible. In our text today, Jim, Jesus simply says, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. It's, it's like a manual phase too. God with us even still. The coming of the Holy Spirit makes everything different. We see differently. <coughs> we see ourselves differently. We see each other differently. We see God differently. Nothing is the same once the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes. We see that we've been made in the image of God. That we're not here by accident, but that God has, has created us. And that there's something within us that resembles God. It's not something of our making. It's not something we've achieved or created. It's not something that we can make or remake. It's not something that we can improve on. It's just there. God made us that way. Sons and daughters. Children of a living God. That's who we are. That's a pretty big one. That's a large thing for most of us to realize. That there is a God, that God knows who we are, and that God wants to be in relationship with us. But the Holy Spirit doesn't stop teaching us there. It doesn't stop opening our eyes there. The next question that comes is, do you think you're the only person God created? Do you think that, that you're the only reason that God sent Jesus Christ into the world to live and suffer and to die? No. There are other folks out there. There are other people out there created in the same image of God. Resembling God in the same way that you do. Those folks that Jesus came for, lived for, died for. They're abundant. They're scattered all over the globe. They're neighbors, some across the street and some across the sea. But these are people. These are people created in the image of God. That God wants you to see. See differently maybe than you've ever seen them before. Not so much as strangers or even as enemies, but as neighbors, as brothers and sisters in Christ. The Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to see. Teaching us and shaping our lives, opening our eyes and opening our hearts. Where do we go? Where do we go to see? We take our cue from Thomas. What did Thomas want to see? He wanted to see the wounded places, the scars. 
If we would see Jesus today, I would suggest that, that we ought to follow the wounds. Go with folks who are broken and hurting. Speaking just a few weeks ago to a woman who been married 27 years and her husband left. She's completely bewildered, filled with despair, hurting, anxious, angry, bitter. But Jesus is there. Because that's where Jesus goes. The broken and the hurting, the lost and alone. That's where you'll see Jesus. If you want to see Jesus, go to, to those folks in those places where those people are hurting broken, in pain, even still. What does it look like when we see Jesus? I would not presume to, to describe that experience for you, but, but I want to share some of what it's looked like for me and, and, and the joy of it. When you think about, it, you, you know, I'm, when I say Pentecost, you know that Pentecost is the day that, that we traditionally, we call that the birthday of the church. It's a time of great celebration. And, and a time of celebrating God's power at work in us. God being with us. <coughs> Which is no small thing. I grew up in East Tennessee. Uh, in in a, a county where, where there, were, there were Baptists and there were Methodists and there were Presbyterians and there were more Baptists. You know. <laughs> and not, a, not a lot of Episcopalians, not a lot of Catholics, not, not a lot of mainline other, other than Methodists and Presbyterians, but didn't hear a lot of positive things about Roman Catholicism when I was growing up in the church there in East Tennessee. In fact, on the radio oftentimes you, you'd hear some rather negative things. Uh, they, they questioned whether or not Catholics were even Christians. That's, that's where I grew up. And, and then I went to school and, and I I learned some other things and I actually met some people. It's amazing what meeting people will actually do to change you and how God can use that to open your heart and your life to being in a relationship with others different from you. Came back to East Tennessee. I was pastoring a church. Our church is involved in this, this ministry that provides housing to, to homeless families who are experiencing a housing crisis once a week, each quarter. We actually were housing those families in our church facility. But we didn't do it alone. We had another congregation who came along beside us and, and helped us provide meals and, and serve in the different volunteer roles that occurred that week. And, and it's our host week. And I'm, I'm walking down the hall and I look into our fellowship hall and, and our, our, our partner congregation, our, our support congregation is there. They're from John the 23rd Parish. Uh, Catholic parish in our town and we partner together to minister to these families that are experiencing a housing crisis they don't have a place to stay they're staying with us and, and I look in there and I see I see I see Baptists and I see Catholics and I see families in need sitting around the table eating supper and in the breaking and blessing of bread <coughs> see Jesus. You remember that story? story of Emmaus, the two disciples. They get Jesus to their house. They sit at a table. They break bread. They bless it. They bless it and they break it and they recognize Christ. You remember the story the sheep and the goats. The righteous asked Jesus or asked the king, when did we see you? And the king says, you saw me when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers or sisters, who was hungry or thirsty or in prison or sick. Seeing Jesus happens when we, when we put ourselves with the people and in places where Jesus already is. And He's in places that we never dreamed of. I mean, North Africa, in Morocco, in the Mid Atlas Mountains. Staying at home of a man named Zaid. Zaid is Moroccan. In Morocco, he is bound by the Constitution to be Muslim. It's illegal. 
It's unconstitutional for a Moroccan citizen to be anything other than Muslim. And it's late. It's late at night. And again, we're sitting around a table in Zaid's home, sharing a meal, breaking bread. And Zaid begins to speak and he begins to explain to those of us who are visiting with him that Muhammad is the son of an earthly father. And we don't think much about that. And then out of nowhere, Zaid says, but Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Astounding. Never expected to hear that. Didn't, didn't expect to see Jesus show up in that way, in that place, so far from home. But Jesus is like that. Jesus didn't just create the United States. Jesus didn't just create uh, North Carolina and Tennessee. Jesus, Jesus created the whole world, came for it, longs for it, loves it, died for it, calls us to it even today. Even today. Henry Nellon said it this way. A mosaic consists of thousands of little stones. Some are blue, some are green, some are yellow, some are gold. When we bring our faces close to the mosaic, we can admire the beauty of each stone. But as we step back from it, we can see that all these little stones reveal to us a beautiful picture. Telling a story none of these stones can tell by itself. It's what our life in church is about. Each of us, like a little stone, but together we reveal the face of God. Nobody can say, I make God visible, but others who see us together can say, they make God visible. Community, church. It's where humility and glory touch. College Park, Baptist Church, you make God visible. In your home, you make God visible in your city. You make God visible around the world. Even to preachers in East Tennessee. You make God visible in a way that's brand new and fresh and Pentecostal. May the Spirit of God continue to move in you and through you as you see Jesus and you let others see Jesus in you. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.